trust in God. Come on, nothing. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for thee? Well, put your trust in God alone. Change the song. Oh, Jesus. I know you're creative here at Harvest. I know. But sometimes, you know, it's like Christmas songs. There's people that try and do too much with a Christmas song. Keep chestnuts roasting the way they're supposed to be roasted. Come on, say amen. amen. Put your hands up all over the place. Come on, say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. There's, nobody like There's nobody like you. There's nobody that loves me more than you. Me you have every peace, every, peace. every prophetic peace every prophetic. to connect me to my destiny. To my destiny. If I'll follow, you I'll follow you and trust you, trust you. In, the in the time of season, in that perfect timing, Every piece will be released. And I will be that completed picture, that portfolio of the goodness of God to everybody that knows me. I'm a miracle in motion. Somebody give God a big shout today. Come on. Come on. Come on. You may be seated all over the place. We have... Just a couple of hours here. I'm going to get my phone up so I can be punctual with our time here. 2.30. So we have an hour and a half to get you all saved, healed, and delivered. Tell your neighbor, fully cooperate. Come on, tell them, fully cooperate. We can get out of here on time. Mission accomplished. The book of Acts, chapter 14. Just want to talk about a few things here this morning. This was... Uh, and let me say this before we go any further. You know, these meetings you're having, and they're really incredible. Um, I mean, I go a lot of places all over the world. I'm in a lot of churches. And uh, if you had asked me, would I rather have revival meetings or would I rather have a spirit of revival in the church? I'll take the spirit of revival in the church. Revival meetings end. They end. Workers get tired. You can only go so many days. And, you know, it just becomes a stress on a lot of people. And a lot of times, even the fruit of those extended revivals, and we have history, we, recent history to understand a lot of that harvest doesn't remain. Remember, it's not the harvest that you get, it's the harvest that you keep. It's not how much money you've made in your life, it's how much do you have. It's not what you get that counts, it's what you keep. I'm going to say that again. Put your hands up. Come on, say, it's not what I get. It's what I keep. We're to be keepers of the treasure. Fruit that remains. Doesn't do anybody any good, the church, you, or your testimony, to get healed and lose it by Tuesday. You know, or to make you $3 million, tell the whole church, and a year later you're broke. The idea is to nurture the anointing, nurture what you get. Don't take it for granted. The devil's a very, very good thief, and he doesn't come to destroy you. He comes first to steal, then kill, then destroy, because if he can steal from you the very goodness of God, then you lose track of it. You're not a good check uh, balancer, bookkeeper. You don't remember a lot of the good things. You remember more of the bad things. You've got to really train your mind to remember the good things of God. He beat me out of the, he delivered me from the paw of the bear and from the paw of the lion. And his memory of the faithfulness was what delivered him in the present. Same with healing. You know, he healed me of this and he healed me of that and he's going to heal me of this. But if you forget all of that and you don't keep record of God's faithfulness, of what he did for you, that he was always there for you, then you're always starting over. 
You know, you don't have any. The word the devil's afraid of, write this down. The word the devil's most afraid of is the word accumulation. He don't mind if someone gave you $1,000 today or $10,000 today, but he don't want that 10,000 to grow into 100,000. He don't mind if you're anointed in some area today, but he don't want you to become multidimensional. He don't matter if you get your family saved, but don't go starting with workers. You know, he wants you to have enough and not, not enough to really do him harm. God wants you to, what, 30, 60, 90, 100? It's just, it, it's never ending. Glory to? Glory. Oh, you didn't say it right. Glory to? Glory. Here you go. Accumulation. So, you know, sometimes in the natural, we think, well, if I have this much money, then I can retire comfortably. Why would you put a ceiling on that? Why would you put a ceiling on that whenever you serve the God of unlimited supply, where, where money appears in the mouth of fish? Come on, say, money is anywhere God wants to put it. The banks aren't in business to give you money. They're in the business to take your money. So is every other insurance company. So is every, every ever lending and savings and loan company. There's nobody out there that is in business to get you money. The only place that wants to get you money is the kingdom of the living God. Come on, somebody give God a shout. Come on. But, but tonight, put your hands up today. I hear it. I said tonight already. Come on, say, I have been handed over. I've been handed over into the hands of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he handed me over. He said, I give you another. So my life right now and every detail of my life is in the hands of the Holy Spirit. The Bible shows me how to live, gives me morality and the truth. But the daily details of my life are in the hands of the Holy Spirit. He knows all things. Who to marry? Oh, yeah, they got quiet on that one right there. You say, I got, I got Bozo. Well, you're going to get Boaz pretty soon. So listen to me. Say every detail. Who to marry? Well, you're still stuck on that. It was like a sudden drop off. Let's start all over again. My details of my life. Is in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Where to work. Where to live. Where to go to church. How much money I should give. Who I should marry. Oh, you did it good. Come on, give God a You did it. You did it. That was funny. Oh, you're, you're so obvious, I'll tell you. Hey, but I wanted to say this before we as I say anything, I, as I was saying, the, the success of these meetings, and I'm only here last night and, and today, your pastors, let me just take a minute because anything this special is worth attacking. Uh, years ago, I was complaining to God about all the warfare. I mean, I was just on a, on a whining expedition with God. You know, that doesn't go too far. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Like Jeremiah, he told Jeremiah, quit crying, Jeremiah. You should cry about everything, the weeping prophet. Don't, I don't want to hear woe is me one more time. If you read Jeremiah, it's pretty amazing. But I was on one of those whining, whining expeditions, you know. You know, I'm doing this, and then this isn't happening, and then where's the money that I need, and, and this person betrayed me, and I was just whining and whining and whining. Yet I was seeing miracles, un, uh, crazy miracles. And as that, as that behavior continued, the Holy Spirit came to me, and he said, Billy, 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 stop it. I said, but Lord, you know, I didn't know this went with it. I didn't know that this was part of the deal. And he said, here's what he said to me. You are worth attacking. I said, wow, th thanks for that wonderful, wonderful information there. He said, there's a day that you wasn't. You were no threat. You were no threat. Remember, the tree don't get the birds till it gets a little bigger. A little tree is insignificant to the devil and to the birds. 
So they, those birds are foul birds or demons, right? So that little tree stays, but when the tree gets bigger, the more birds come and they lodge in the tree. They begin to affect the tree. They hibernate right inside big congregations or growing ministries or thriving revivals, whichever. And I just wanna say that nothing like this just happens without good leadership. Without good leadership. And I, uh, I'm, I'm always, I, I like taking record of where I'm in a great place, things are moving. I like to look at the leaders and see if they're carrying the ark or touching the ark. Because we're called to carry it, but not touch it. Carry it, you live. Everything continues. Touch it, you die. Revivals come to a close. Shut down. Somebody commits adultery. Somebody steals money. Somebody, somebody, whatever. And, you know, what I, what I sensed here is these two people in the front row, right to my right, are amazing people. No, I really mean that. I really mean that. And I, uh, you need to protect them with your prayers and with anything else anybody would say to you that's contrary to the truth. Because most people don't know too much, they just throw mud at the wall. So anything like this doesn't go unchallenged, whether it's the healings or the leadership or the music or, you know, the casualness. He wears golf shirts and tennis shoes to church. I, I, it's pretty amazing. And he said, we're going to play golf the next time that I'm here. I can hardly wait. It's really going to be, it is going to be amazing. But I, I just want to say that it's, it's important that you know how blessed you are. Because there's something these two are doing so right. I don't even know if they know. Sometimes growth is a mystery. When Moses looked at the burning bush, he didn't go, I got you figured out. No, he looked right or left. I mean, my left, you're right. And then he looked this way. And the Bible says he couldn't figure out why this bush was burning. It was an enigma. And sometimes that's exactly what success is. God doesn't want it to be, you know, emulated or a recipe or a carbon copy. Something here is really organic. It's taking place and you're in it. And sometimes when you're in it, you can't see all of it. So just before I begin this morning, I want you to know that this, this is a pretty amazing thing you're involved in here. I don't know where it's going. They don't know where it's going. It's just going. And it's your job to just support them in your prayers, send them emails, tell them how special they are, that message that they learned. If you got healed under Jennifer's ministry, hey, Sister Jennifer, Pastor Jennifer, man, let them know how much you mean to them and pay your tithes and offerings. I'm not saying you're not, but if you aren't, pay them. If you, some, if you think somebody else isn't paying theirs, cover their tithes too. <laughs> you're stretching it. That's where we live. We live in the stretch. Everything in this Bible is a stretch, if you think about it. Go out and try and make the sun stand still. You tell somebody, that's a stretch for the Joshua, this is a stretch. You know, go fill water pots up with water and just try to make it wine. I, I, re, I call in wine. Try that. Or the better one yet, go fill your bathtub up and try and walk on the water. Most of what we just take for granted is really a stretch for most people. And even for our own thinking, if you think about it long enough, this is the book of not magic, but miracles. And they're here, they're, they're really behind this miracle. You know, a lot of churches aren't even behind this as much. They used to be. They have this open altar that we've had here last night, and I'm sure you're going to have tonight and until the conference ends. And then what, you're, what I'm hearing here on Sunday mornings, it's just business as usual. I, I, you say it like that, but this is an open heaven you're under. I think this is worth bringing your sleeping bag and find a hiding a place here and, or somewhere near the property. This isn't going to stop anytime soon. This isn't going to stop anytime soon. 
But learn how to defend them properly. Just say, I don't know about that, and I don't know about this. I just know that God's Spirit's on them, you know, and we love our pastors, and just leave it at that. Because someone will try and get to them through you or to get through this, uh, this moving of the Holy Spirit, and you don't want that to happen. Come on, say, not on my watch. Not today, or tomorrow, or anytime soon, the doors are closed. I'm behind them 110%. Come on, give God a big, big shout. If you have your Bible in Acts chapter 14, I'm just going to share a little bit. You know, we're talking about the healing ministry this morning, and I, I would like to share some thoughts on that. I'll open it up for questions. And, and if we can wrap those questions up by around 4 o'clock, anything you want to ask me that I have knowledge of, I'll be happy to share with you. But if I don't have an answer for that, I'm going to probably say I don't know or see your pastor as soon as the service is over. <laughs> I'm serious. This is just, it's an incredible journey because you learn. I've been under great people most of my life. I've been privileged to be associated with some great miracle ministries. Uh, most of them you know. And they just weren't, I just wasn't a student. I was friends. I was, I was, had relationship with some of those people. And you can't help when, you ha re when you're around people that are sold out. When you're around people that are on fa in faith full of fire, sold out with passion to what they're called to do, you can't help get overflow. That's called standing in the shadow of greatness. Come on, put your hands up and say, that's what I need. That's what I, need. I need shadows that I can stand in and get some greatness on me. Fame comes overnight, but greatness comes in time. Come on, give God a big shot for that. Come on. It said there in the Apostle Paul, chapter 14, it says in verse number six, they were, they were aware of it. And they fled unto Lystra and Derby, into the so parts of Lysonia, and unto the region that was lieth around about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man of Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never, everybody say never, never. who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had the faith to be healed. So the question here is, well, if he had the faith, then why wasn't he healed? This is what you will encounter, most of you, if you're ministering healing or want to minister healing, one-on-one, -on -one, because I said last night, and I'm not begrudging anybody here, a, a ministry full of stadiums and ballpark, whatever, but for the most part, right now, you and I know that most of the people you're going to be praying for is one-on-one, -on -one, okay? And you're going to bump into people just like this who have a condition, a very serious condition. They're going to have the faith to be healed, but they can't get healed. It's important that you see it here scripturally. See, these are, this is a very rare story. There's not a lot of these. Yet there's a lot of people just like this. So we've got to quit assuming that if somebody's not healed, it's because they don't have any faith. That is deadly, it's dangerous, and it's destructive. And you leave people leaving your presence. You meant well, but your mouth really hurt them so deeply. They love God as much as you. They go to church maybe even more than you. They probably don't even do as many bad things as you do or think, or whatever, maybe not, whatever. But the point of it is, is that, you know, they, we judge them thinking, well, they need more faith. They need more, who doesn't need more faith? There's only a few people that Jesus ever said had great faith. Just a couple, a handful of people. So our faith is ever being set back, and it's growing. And, but that's not the point here. The point here is today that I want to talk to you. Yet this man had the faith, yet he was crippled. Kind of like you have the money, but you don't have the car. Well, how could you not have the car if you have the money? It's like you have, you have, the, you have the food, yet you're starving. 
how can you be starving if you have the food? And so here's a man that is crippled. He can't walk, never walked, never walked. It wasn't like he walked and then he couldn't walk. He never walked. And yet he had the faith. So what I wanna talk about briefly is if you're gonna see results in healing, you have to learn how to unlock people's faith. Say unlock, unlock. the faith they already have. They already have. Say this again, everybody's faith. Everybody's faith. A mustard seed, mustard seed or a boatload boat can be unlocked. Can be so most people that you and I know, I'm not saying everybody because there may be people out there who absolutely our faith broke, could be. I'm sure they're there. But most, the category of most people have at least a mustard seed. And all they need is a mustard seed to get unparalyzed. All they need is a mustard seed to get healed of stage four. Just a mustard seed. But it's all locked up. They don't know why it's locked up. It could be a number of reasons. So we don't want to get into that because it could be enormous what damages people's faith. But the key is how do you unlock it? Because you're sitting in a restaurant. You have an hour to have lunch and they don't have all day and you don't have all day. You know, you meet them in the parking lot after church and, you know, you love them. You've been praying for them. You carry a prayer cloth for them. Just because you know healing scriptures don't mean you get healed. Uh, I'm gonna say that one again. Just because you know all the healing scriptures doesn't mean bring automatic healing. Automatic ended in the Garden of Eden. That's where everything automatic ended. Everything must be appropriated. Everything. Adam and Eve had, had everything for free. They didn't know how good they had it, but when that talking snake came and boom, that garden was closed, and from there on in, it was killing animals to get the blood, then it was Holy Ghost in a wooden box, then it was Holy Ghost in a, mar in, a, in a canvas tent, then it was Holy Ghost in a marble temple, then it was Holy Ghost in another marble temple, then it was Holy Ghost in Jesus, and then finally it was Holy Ghost in you and I. Come on. You know, nothing automatic, everything must be appropriated. There's a course of action that you and I can take for ourselves but when you're helping other people, you can't be afraid to put them to work. Because if nobody wants to invest in their own recovery, then they don't want to recover too bad. You got, you got to engage with Holy Ghost. You got to engage with your mustard seed or you got to engage with your, uh, with your boatload, whatever level of faith you have. But there's, there's a time whenever you can't breastfeed when is that? When you have teeth. <laughs> it's taking a while, but you all get it in a minute. <laughs> At least I know the women are getting it. Come on, say, when you have teeth. You have teeth. No more breastfeeding. <laughs> There's a time whenever you have to really realize, wow, you can't get more out of the, altar, the elders, the pastor, the meetings, you know, and you gotta really begin to own responsibility you know, for transforming into another type of believer. You know, I mean, that's where you take the notes. That's where you memorize. That's where you give up sleep time, food time, and leisure time. So if you can't let God intervene in your, in your time zones, then you're after a convenient healing. You're after a drive-by deliverance or a takeout healing. Hey, man, I had a lady call me years ago, called the office. This was years ago. I mean, I didn't hold anything to it, I just laughed, but she said, tell Pastor Billy I need to see him. I have two devils in me. And she said, I need to get them out, they're ruining my life, but she said, I can be there by one. I have a hair appointment at 12. <laughs> I, no, I can be there at one o'clock, but I have to pick my children up at three o'clock. So ask him if he can get two devils out by three. <laughs> Serious? Well, don't laugh, you may not say that, but some of you think that. And my secretary came in, she said, can you believe this? I said, yeah, that's what's out there. Convenience, drive-by, take-out. 
I got to fit this into my schedule. God says, sorry. If it doesn't cost you something, it isn't worth anything. Come on, say, my effort, my desire, my level of pursuit matters to God. Nobody rode a camel to get here today. I looked in, I checked the parking lot. There's some nice cars out there. I don't even see any bicycles. You know, these people rode camels. They ripped off roofs. They climbed trees. Their desperation for their, what they wanted was shown. So a lot of things were pushed to the side to demonstrate to God effort, desire. Whatsoever things you... Now, why would you say that word? Because you read it. But whenever your desire to do other things is greater than your desire to memorize a healing verse, which, you know, I said they, they don't guarantee you anything, but they still help position you. They help put you in the right position to hear Holy Spirit, to give you a level of confidence. If you don't take matter in, in reading the labels on what you're eating or drinking, canola oil will kill you. Yet it's in all the salads. It's the cheapest oil restaurants can buy. They don't cook an avocado or, or you know, the olive oil. They don't cook in that. Too expensive. Sometimes that oil doesn't work with the severe heat. But the point of it is what they do cook in, ask them. As soon as you hear that word canola, that's like shooting cholesterol right into your arteries. But that's what they use. And it tastes good. You know, and you don't even know the difference. Yet you who never had any heart disease or your family have any heart disease, how, how are you having heart disease? What's causing a lot of these illnesses? It's right in the stuff that's being cooked. Why doesn't Russia grow any of the, uh, the Monsanto food? They won't let Monsanto into their harvest fields because they don't want their people to... As crazy as that is, I want to control you, but I, they realize I want to control healthy people. America's about the big dollar. Ukraine isn't about property, it's about wheat. It's about controlling the food supply of the world. This food was the first reason the human race fell, was over. Oh, wow, what's going on here? Over, over food over the forbidden fruit. It wasn't over a bank account or a Mercedes or a beautiful vet or a high-rise condo on Miami Beach. It was over forbidden fruit. Don't eat this forbidden fruit. And what did the devil say, the talking snake? You won't, you won't die. So this whole thing over food goes way back. I'm not gonna stay on this subject. I'm just saying that your desire to really stay healthy you have to do more than just go to church and get slain. So if you don't, if you don't believe right, you won't live right. So you've got to begin to, if you want to help other people get healed, you've got to become multidimensional. Because I can pray now, I don't do it a lot in public meetings because my heart is never to condemn anybody. But there's people that are standing right in front of me, I can tell you more so than enough, many, many times, I can even tell you the food they're eating. But that's not my job to get in there and mess with you. My job is to try and give you as clear path as to God knows what's going on here, kind of stay away from this. I'm not Holy Ghost, never want to be seen as Holy Ghost. But there's a lot of people who are spirit-filled that aren't that filled. I mean, spirit-filled is a strong, strong word. Being led by the Spirit. Because I'll tell you, if you trust everybody else with your portion control and, your, and what you're eating and how much you're eating, why did Jesus let the demons leave the man and go into the pigs? Because you can't kill the parasites in the pork. No matter how hot you cook anything, you can't kill parasites. I had a lady in Toronto, she came to me, she said, I have snakes in me, I have real snakes. We were on the stage, the cameras were rolling, and 
I said, snakes? I said, what are you talking about? Well, she picked up her blouse right by her, her brassiere, her bra line, and you could see the snakes crawling in her body. You could see the heads on the snakes. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I was like shocked. I thought she was kind of crazy maybe or you know, messed up up here. And I shouldn't have thought that. I, I confess I shouldn't have thought that. <laughs> but when you're around as many people as I'm around that are into all kind of stuff, and there they were. I was right in front of me, and I thought, oh, Lord. She says, can you get these out? I said, well, yeah, and I put my hand in, and I said, Holy Ghost, where are they gonna go? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> I mean, I just, I had a lapse. I'd never come across that kind of confrontation. And we're on a big stage in a huge church, and, and they're all watching, and they hear this over the microphone. I said, well, amen, I'm not sure. Oh, Lord, where are they gonna go? I said, Lord, where are they gonna go? And he said, where do you think they're gonna go? I said, oh, Lord, I don't know where they're gonna go. He said, you don't know where they're gonna go? You think a physical snake is gonna come out and crawl on the stage? I said, that's right, this is a spiritual thing. I, I was having a lapse. I, I was being stunned because I had never seen that before. And she said, can you help me? <laughs> can you help me? Get them out. Get them out, preacher. Get them out. I'm thinking, holy ghost, lady, calm down. I, I'd never done that, never seen that. That's how you grow, running into stuff you've never confronted before. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you're like Jesus, utterly dependent. Come on, say, Jesus, Jesus. was utterly <laughs> dependent <laughs> on Holy Ghost. <laughs> he said, I of myself do so if he of himself did nothing, then we of ourselves can do nothing. He emptied himself. He didn't have any of that power. He functioned as a regular man under that anointing. And he said, I need that. Come on, both hands up. Come on, say, I need the anointing. I'm not handsome enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have that much charisma. I need the anointing. Need Come on, give God a shout. Come on. Come on. Come on. So I, in a couple of seconds, I boom, boom, I prayed those things, and, they, and then they just left her. Well, my, again, my reaction was, are they, you know, where are they? And I tried to do it in such a way the congregation, well, they didn't hit the stage, of course. They came out of her. And later I said, Lord, what were those? He said, those were parasites. Those were parasites. Those were parasites. So if a casket is sealed, why wouldn't they open up a casket is there worms? Because there were parasites in that body. So what you eat matters. It matters how you feel. It matters how much energy you have. It matters how long you may live. You can't claim 70 years and violate all these other principles. You can't hate your mother and father and eat good. Remember this, atheists like vitamins. People that worship the devil, you know, drink protein shakes. Serial killers take vitamin C. Come on, somebody help me here. So sometimes we think we're doing all this great stuff. Oh, I take a handful of vitamins and I got the latest thing on the, from Dr. So-and-so and, and the Lord gave me, he gave you that, of course he did. But you gotta understand, anything in the natural, anything in the natural, yeah, but I buy this machine, I get hooked up to this machine, it recirculates my blood and stimulates my, that's amazing. Well, somebody evil has that. It's no mystery, it's just money. What they don't have is the name. They don't have the blood. They don't have the promises. So don't let everything natural suddenly replace Everything you're coming in here to learn. You can't leave the name alone. Yeah, but I'm drinking this green stuff. I feel so much better. Well, just, just remember that green stuff is taken by devil worshipers, street girls, gamblers. Probably half the people in Vegas are drinking that so they can stay up at night. You, don't, don't give up on the name. Every prayer you pray. Before you meet somebody, that, those tongues that you have but never use, come on, they keep you highly activated, full of crisp and current power, 
They replace your personality. They replace what you don't know yet. What replaces what I don't know yet? The presence coming from you. Rivers of living water. No water comes out of anybody. Presence, it's about presence. I'm on fire, catch the fire. There's no fire coming out of anybody. It's presence. What do people feel around you? Who wants to feel you? <laughs> hey, I'm here to pray for you. Here's some of me. Here, here. Just... <laughs> you're worried about what you smell like, how your hair is, if you're dressed right, if you said the right words. God says, man, my presence, I want to blow through you. I just want to borrow you. About three years ago, I had just come out of so many meetings, and I said, Lord, I just feel so used. He said, well, that's what you prayed for. I said, people are taking advantage of me. He said, well, that's what you asked for. They used me. They're going to use you. They're going to love you, and they're going to leave you. Some will say thanks. Some will never say thanks. Some will give you a buck and think they did everything in the world. You raise them from the dead. Here's a dollar. Come on, somebody help me here. But a lot of people that you meet, they want to be well, but they don't know how to unlock their faith. Let me give you a few things that will help you do that. That's what I'm going to concentrate on, then I'll open it up for you. This is what I've found in my 45 years of being in this kind of a ministry. I haven't always understood what I'm about to tell you. I've been at, I've been at the luxury of being around some real, Catherine Coleman, I, I loved Catherine. She was a friend. I was healed there, but I learned a lot there. Other ministries after that soon followed. So I watched, I learned, I just, I wanted to absorb everything that I could. You know, and you don't get somebody else's mantle. Mantle's not in the New Testament. Double portion's not in the New Testament. What's in the New Testament is unlimited measure. So what would you rather have, two Corvettes or unlimited Corvettes? Okay, How, what would you rather have? Two free passes to the salon to get your nails done? <laughs> or unlimited the rest of your life? <laughs> Sometimes, guys, I gotta talk to the ladies. That's just the way it works. <laughs> unlimited. Unlimited. So be careful you're not waiting for someone to die to get their mantle. Oh, good, Oral's gone. Oh, more Cyrilda's gone. Oh, oh, I'm next in line. Be careful, you may go too. Come on, somebody. You, <laughs> you, you may go too. Come on, so I have the mantle of the Holy Ghost. I have an unlimited measure. At any time, in any place, at any given moment, I could put a prophecy on somebody. I could put a, my hands on somebody. I could speak a word to knock down that giant and cause a head to roll. Come on, somebody give God a shout. Hey! But what, what dilemma you're faced with, like I said, one-on-one -on -one at that restaurant, at that Starbucks coffee shop, in the parking lot, somebody you meet on a, on a bus, on a plane. I have so many encounters on planes. I love it because they can't go anywhere. <laughs> they, can't, they can't go anywhere. But he, here's the deal. When somebody's faith is locked up and you gotta get their faith unlocked to hear what you wanna say to them, there's nothing that replaces, listen to me, nothing that substitute for a turned on believer, a passionate believer about their walk with the Holy Spirit. It's not how anointed you are. It's not how much Bible knowledge you have. It's just that I, I'm so passionately in love with God. I, I go, you may not even know as much as half the people in your church. You may not know all the Bible verses, but you are in love with the master. You walk with him. You're excited about what he's doing in your life. You're passionate about who he says he is and what he can do. You know, and, and you're just, that's who you are. You live your life out loud and on purpose. 
Yet you're held back because you're being told that you need more. I got to get tongues. I got to get anointed. I got to get the certain scriptures done. And then you, you kind of really can ruin everything. You can become so, so, so constipated in your head of what you have to be and yet to do. Because nobody here strives. You, can, you can't be sinless. Nothing you and I do makes us sinless. But we can be saved by grace. And we can still live by grace. Meaning we think wrong, say wrong, but we really make a quick recovery. Forgive me, wash me, master, and stay in the flow. Come on, give God a big shout. Come on. But if you're kind of come and tell me about some great pizza in Turlock that you want me to know about, you better be convincing. You better come with some eyeballs, some personality, and a tongue that's moving around like this and and say, man, let me tell you, Billy Burke, you can't leave her lock. Have you been down to Max Pizza? I know. I, oh, oh. <laughs> you're going to get me down there. And I'm not even hungry for pizza. How you represent him. This, this, this is nothing. That'll open somebody up who's closed as Fort Knox. an excited person. You've all had it happen for pizza or for your nails or where suits are sold or a favorite beach. When people ask me my favorite beach, I just get all weird. Oh. And then they think, I gotta go there. I gotta go to that beach. And then I realize, I don't want anybody to go to that beach. So I'm going to say, yeah, they're all the same. Uh, those beaches are all the same. I got water and you know, sharks. and I would never go there because, you know. So it's very important that you act the part. Do you act the part? Do you come here? Do you worship here? But man, what rings your bell is everything else. Do you exude more excitement over mm, that, that issue? And you got to be careful with that. Why? Because he's watching. He's watching you from the inside out. He's watching you from the outside in. He sees what you want, but your desires don't mash up. Your passion isn't for him. He don't mind giving you anything you want, but he wants you to be passionately in love with him. Passionately talking about him. So why would you want someone, why would you give somebody everything they want if they're ashamed to talk about you? Oh, you want me to show up for your healing? Want me to show up for your ministry? You want me to show up? And here's the deal he made with me. If you can't talk about me privately, one-on-one, -on, -one, on a plane, in a restaurant, then don't be calling me to show up in your meetings. If you can't leave the 99 and go after the one, then, then you and I aren't gonna have the kind of friendship and relationship that you want. I want an all-time, all-available individual. I, I know what it takes to keep you humble, Billy Burke. I know. You're not that humble. I think I am. I don't think so. I try to be. Yeah, you're better. Well, what would you rather me do? Pull away and talk to that person in the restaurant at the bus stop. No music. You know, you're not dressed right. You're tired. You're on your way to a meeting. You're coming from a meeting. Perfect time that there's nothing in you but you. And I just want you to just tell me and show those people what, you know, is the same fire still live in you? Do you still desire to pray for people? Do you really care about that person that can't see, can't hear? Do you have enough time to whisper in their ear, there is a God who's about to show up in your life and do something amazing? You always have to see the harvest, or can you plant seed too? Can you plant seed and, and leave that person to be harvested by somebody else? Come on, somebody give God a big shout. Hurry up, come on. Now, sometimes you realize you plant the seed, and somebody else is going to see them get out of the chair. Most of the people, Billy Graham, got saved that his crusades were seeded by local pastors, grandmothers, grandpas, mothers and fathers, and regular church people. But Billy Graham got to harvest them all.
So when you ask them, where did you get saved? They're, they're quick to say, oh, I got Billy Graham crusade. Billy Graham crusade. Did Billy Graham, all he did was just as I am without, and there they come. The great message preceded that. But who was it that seeded them? Who was it to put up with all their nonsense for 30 years? An ex-wife, a grandmother, who really gets the reward at the Bema seat, at that judgment seat of the believers. So it's very, very important that you understand that, that God wants to use you in amazing, sometimes the seed, sometimes the harvest, sometimes both. Sometimes the sower and the reaper uh, rejoice together. You sow and reap in the same day, in the same hour. But sometimes your job is just to sow seed because you believe in them enough. But your excitement, so if you show up and you want somebody healed, but you kind of talk like maybe, or you kind of talk like I hope, or you kind of talk like, well, you never know, let's pray. Don't touch me. <laughs> Keep your hands to yourself. I don't want cooties from you or anybody else. Come on, say, I don't want the cooties. I don't want the cooties from believers. Come on, say, believers, cooties are the worst cooties you can get. <laughs> That's false hope. You don't want people to walk away with maybe, or you, you want people to walk away, but you want to you be excited. That unlocks people's faith. Just your personal excitement. Come on, say, everything in my cup. It's about Jesus and me, Jesus. Holy Ghost and me, Ghost. the running over. running over, my cup running over, over. is for, for everybody else. See, see, your overflow should be your ministry. It should be an, an, an overflow of your relationship. It shouldn't be something you have to go out there and do and you don't have that relationship. Then you're fighting through your own guilt, your own shame, your own bad days and and you're not, you're not even bring Jesus up. Well, what church are you going to? Well, we go to a good church. And the only thing you can really testify about is your church. That's not a bad thing, but that shouldn't be the only thing. You should be the example with what's on your face, with what people feel around you. You see, I don't care anybody feels around me. You should. You really should. You know, I've had Hell's Angels come into our meeting, some, some of the big guys in Hell's Angels. We've had some of the, some of the biggest, uh, if I said their name, I probably shouldn't, but of the occultic practices in the United States, some Satan's, the big temple out here in San Francisco. They walk in, and, and they carry presents. I mean, Popeye wasn't the only one that had presents. Brutus had presents. Come on, somebody say, <laughs> olive oil even had, ha, olive oil had presents. <laughs> Come on, see, every living thing every has presence. Present. See, your job is to keep your presence up here so that it's not intimidated and so that you have the ability to really unlock people's faith while you yourself are recovering. I don't like it when people say, well, you have to get well before you can pray for healing. That's not true. Jesus was bleeding. Blood was leaving his body. And he was saying, forgive them. In his darkest hour, he was still ministering. And sometimes you're not where you want to be yet. That don't mean you still can't point the way. Come on, give God a shout. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. The baptism was given that people would have power for service before they had character. If Jesus had to wait till everybody had character, we'd still be waiting. The fruit of the Spirit your character. That comes over time as you submit, as you stay close. But that baptism was to get people, what, filled with God with power ahead of their character so they could go do the works of Jesus while they themselves was catching up. It's very, very important that even though you don't feel right or if, you're, if you haven't been taught that way, then you've got to take a step back and say, how can I contain this love of God? Or the healing that I saw last night? Or the healing your pastor read to you this morning? Second thing that can unlock people is your personal story about your own recovery. 
Why on God's green earth are people not wanting to do this? It amazes me. You want to you be a preacher, but the most explosive thing you know in the moment is what have you been delivered from? What has he healed you from? What deliverance have you had? I mean, all Mary Magdalene had was her testimony was seven devils come out, all seven, seven devils, seven devils. What else did she do? She didn't do nothing else. She wasn't a scholar. She wasn't a theologian. I never heard Mary Magdalene has an anointing. Mary Magdalene, the moon whom Jesus cast out, seven devils. And so whenever Jesus needed a strong test, Mary, tell him what happened. Hey, I had seven devils. <laughs> Come on, say, it didn't seem like much. But if you had a devil, you were afraid of Mary. <laughs> Come on, somebody give God a shout. Come on. And then as you learn scripture, as you learn the word of God, of course, then you begin to balance his written word with your story. But until that happens, you still have a story. Yeah, but my story isn't that great. Well, what, what about the deviated septum here? Does that sound like an earth-shaking, shattering story? Look at the cascading effect of that. That can mess up your breathing, your talking, your sense of smell. I mean, COVID, I mean, the COVID, the, 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 the reaping effect of COVID, I mean, from brain fog to no smell to, to memory to all kind of ish side effects that are people that are still you know, recovering from. Little hinges open up big doors. Small foxes spoil the vines. So don't, don't ever dismiss something that happened to you you know, that can unlock somebody's faith. When, it, when Pastor read that testimony, to him, I just, we just kind of laughed in the back room. I mean, who would ever think? Somebody being here, here of deviated. Whoever thought that it was going to call Ballas was going to call Bob, and Bob was going to call Harry, and Harry was going to call. <laughs> who thought that? It's God that takes little or big. And, oh, come on, somebody. And here's a girl that came that wasn't even a believer and somebody else that says, I've had this for 30 years. And down through the cavern from a meeting, an insignificant seemingly word, and people were set free. And probably will end up in the mansion next to you on Glory Avenue. Come on. <laughs> Your testimony, you gotta quit thinking, I don't have that great of a story. It'll unlock people's faith. And you may have a story more to tell than you're ashamed to tell. You don't want people to know that you were that or that you did this. And now you have a great story that's undercover. That, that is so sad. There's so many people suffering. Yeah, but if people knew that I did that, they might see how big God is. They won't think less of you. They'll be shocked by your humility, helped by your humility, and that gives God a chance to promote you. Yeah, but I don't want to be known for being healed of hemorrhoids. I don't want anyone to know that I had. I'll tell anybody anything but hemorrhoids. I'm not telling no hemorrhoid story. So you and all the hemorrhoid people just to suffer, can they get help? True story, I was in a meeting in Tampa, and I had a word, HIV was being healed, the virus. I said, you're in the late stages, you're HIV, you're here, you're getting healed. Nobody moved. Well, that didn't surprise me. I said, a little while, I said, come on. I said, whoever's here with that HIV, I need you up here. Nobody moved. So we moved on, take and pass on about a half an hour. I said, there's also a few people here that have a severe fever, severe fever. Well, boy, they just lined up for the fever. There's the fever people, all these fever people right up. No, no, no embarrassment with the fever. Everybody gets a fever. So I went down the line, touched this fever person, touched this fever. I just was touching them. I came to this one guy, and I stopped. I didn't know why I stopped. And I said, Lord, he said, this is your guy right here. So I said, you, you, you're here for a fever? He said, yeah, fever. 
And he was sweating. I said, there's something else going on here. He said, uh, yeah. He said, uh, wonder about a little girl. I said, okay. He said, I didn't want to come up, but I thought I could slide in on the fever one. Tricky, tricky, tricky. <laughs> Isn't Jesus the one that said, weren't there 10 of you? Yeah. Come on, say, he does count. Yeah. He does keep record. Yeah. He knows in who he touches. Yeah. He knows who has testimonies. Yeah. He knows who has glory sitting inside of them, yeah. waiting to unlock other people's faith. Yeah. Come on, somebody give God a shout here today. Yeah. So I said, do you want me to say anything? Because I was whispering back. And now I'm whis he has me whispering. I said, do you, want me to, do you want me to say anything about this? He said, uh, and I said, what you, this could help so many people. He said, I guess. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, here's a gentleman right here. I couldn't wait to tell everybody, you know. <laughs> and I told him, and then he was slain. He was healed. He was on the cocktail. He came off the cocktail. The virus left him. And people then begin to just go past me and call him. I need you to touch me because they now know here's a guy that came through it. Come on, he fought the bear and the lion. Come on, somebody give God a shout. See, this healing ministry is more about what you carry than what you're able to release. There's not how much knowledge you have. Sometimes your biggest hindrance is you know so much. The less I know, the more I need Holy Spirit. The more I need to really yield to him everywhere that I can. You know, so if, if, if my excitement don't do it, my passionate quest for God don't open somebody up and unlock them, a story can. If that can't do it, whoa, what if that can't do it? Then you may have to get into some kind of prophetic word. You know, God's been speaking to me about you. Whether it's a letter or a text, I came, I woke this morning and this verse was on my mind. And a, and, a vo and a verse, a prophetic word. I saw you in a field and I saw you next to a well. And you couldn't get to the well, but someone came in, looked like an angel that just gave you water. I just passed that on to you. Just passing that on to you. But however, word, however that prophetic word comes to you can unlock somebody's faith. Gifts of the Spirit can unlock somebody's faith. I was standing on a stage in Queens, New York. I don't even know. It's the first time I ever called out. I think her name was Roseanne. I don't know any Roseannes. I said, somebody here named Roseanne. Well, we were streaming that night. And I, I heard that so clear, so clear. And so I said, Roseanne, where are you? Well, Roseanne was somewhere in, I think, Virginia Beach or somewhere. And she was picking up that stream who was related to a person on my staff. And man, when that meeting was over, that was me, that was me. And man, the power of God hit her in the house just over that word of knowledge that wasn't on location. But I actually heard it. I wasn't just shooting a name into the dark. I heard that name. So it's important that that unlocks people's faith. It's important that you, you whether it's a scripture whether it's a phone call, you were on my mind, and just caring for people. Healing is in hearing. Hearing is healing. Nobody wants to take the time to listen to anybody. People are busy. I get it. But if you want a healing ministry, you're going to have to listen to people. Jesus had an ear. The reason he cared is he listened to people. He listened to what they, today we don't even listen to people. If somebody starts to tell you, hey, I went, let's get together sometime for lunch. Yeah, we'll do that. I mean, I, what's a good month for you as you're walking away? How about October of 2027? We'll get together. <laughs> right after Christmas. We'll sit down and just say, yeah. Nobody has any time. And if they start to talk, you don't want to go too deep. You don't want to get into all that. Now, when I'm at the altar, I, I mean, I cut people off. Not that I want to be rude to anybody, but I'm on a crunch of time. I would love to hear their story because everybody has them. And if Jesus hadn't gone to the story of the woman at the well, 
What was her broken story? I, my, my relationships don't work. I don't know how to stay married. I'm a broken woman. I have a broken covenant spirit working in me. And every time I fall in love with somebody, it just never works. I meet the wrong man. I, I just can't make it work. She had to vent that to somebody. And Jesus came in with a word of knowledge that I know the one you're with now and, and the five. And the, I mean, he unlocked, he, but he took away her sad story. If you don't get somebody's sad story, it'll be with them the rest of their life and that will be the excuse they use that they never got well, that they never prospered, that they never raised their children right. They'll always go back to that sad story, that abortion. Come on, somebody say that divorce, that whatever. They'll go back to, until you break that connection with that sad story. Well, how do you get rid of a sad story? You listen. You're never going to get to that story just in having coffee in Starbucks. What most people are going to say is keep me in prayers. They're not going to tell you why. They're not going to tell you why. I mean, two kids came to me in Puerto Rico. We were in a huge meeting and they were sitting three rows back or something. I, I called them. I said, how are you guys doing today? And boy and a girl, young, you know, young guys, teenagers. And they said, yeah. I said, your girlfriend and boyfriend. And he said, yeah. And she said, yeah. And, and she spoke up. She said, we both have gonorrhea. <laughs> I wanted to be gonorrhea too. Come on, somebody. <laughs> like I'm gonorrhea right here. I'm gonorrhea. You know. I mean, he, and he didn't like that. He didn't like that he told on her. And she said, yeah, we're really, we blisters everywhere. And, and I was like, well, and people just, there was a lot of, she's, they're just, the crowd's like, what's going on here? And I said, well, listen, I don't want, I love you guys, but let me tell you something. You guys aren't married. And he says, how do you know that? I said, well, I'm hearing you're not married. She says, he's right. He is absolutely right. He said, well, what are you on his side? Whose side are you on? I'm on? She said, I'm trying to be on God's side. What do you mean on God's side? She said, I'm trying to be on God's And these two were going at it. And then she said, you gave me this. You gave me this gonorrhea. I said, calm down. You both, you both need help. I'm going to pray. God's going to touch you. These blisters are going to disappear. I couldn't even keep a dry eye. That's, that's how devastating this was to them. These were somebody's, they had parents. They had grandparents. And then she said these words, and the doctors told me I could never have a baby. See, you, they, people have to be able to vent, not just to a dead ear, but they have to be able to vent to somebody just like you who can knock that out of the way and say, buddy, in the name. Come on, say, in the name. Hey. Buddy, in the name. Hey. Everybody vents to the wrong people. Down to the bar, and he'd tell the bar, yeah, I got gonorrhea. And then, yeah, that's pretty bad. I had something like that myself when I was young. <laughs> There's a guy in my church that has that. I work with a lady that has that. But more power to you, buddy. I have one on me. You know, it's just like you tell your story to the wrong person. Or you're at a family reunion. Yeah, pray for me. I got, you know, I was diagnosed with venereal disease. Oh, that's, you know, you getting treatment? Uh-huh. Are you sure it's a good place? I can get you a good name of a good... I need a prayer. I need a prophecy. I need somebody with faith that says this too shall pass. Come on. That's why, that's what God's raising up, not just for hearers to hear. But here's to say, hey, you know, that's like when that snake bit the apostle Paul, it found out real quick I bit the wrong person. I died and he didn't. Come on, say amen. <laughs> you know, you just want to be a news gatherer. I hate it when people want to know just to know. Yeah. They even do it in church. Hey, I wanted to ask you, how, how's... How's your wife doing? What's, what are they saying? Yeah, yeah, 
Wow. You know, you're such a strong, all they want to do is know. There's no prayers. There's no tongues. There's no scripture. There's nothing. There may be a pat on the back that says, well, just to know we're, we love you. We love you both so much. Come on, that kind of love is what ran Woodstock. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it was free and it was terrible. Come on, say, if I hear about it, I have a God. The greater one lives in me. I happen to know a few verses. I've happened to be at ringside for some miracles. I believe all things are possible. You have to cultivate the all things are possible attitude. You have to cultivate that. It's not automatic. If you think it's automatic, you're going to run into something that breaks your own faith. And you can't be a bridge to somewhere. You become a bridge to nowhere. You've got to cultivate that because there's always a doctor. There's always someone that knows more than you. But the doctor said, they told Abraham, you're too old. You're 99. You're going to have any sperm. Don't try. You don't have no sperm. Don't even try. <laughs> they told Sarah, don't even try. You have no eggs. Your eggs are gone. No eggs, you know, no eggs. So what's happened? A lady with no eggs meets up a man with no sperm. <laughs> Come on, say, clearly impossible. <laughs> oh, but I forget, I forgot. There's a God, there's a God in heaven. Oh, come on, somebody. <laughs> Who said, you're gonna have a child. So now they had to push out the bad seed, the contaminated seed of that report. They just can't sing one time, whose report will you believe? <laughs> the devil says, I'll wait and get you at home when there's no drummer. Come on, somebody. Yeah. You're gonna cultivate that ahead of time. And what happens is that you can really intercept that no sperm, no egg as we know. That's why that miracle story is our story. There's no way possible. And then here's what Christians say. Yeah, but it's gonna take a miracle. He has a few of those. No, but I mean a really big one. He has a couple of those. No, no, you don't know what I'm saying. I mean, it's gonna take something like gigunda. <laughs> Lady, you're running on the adjectives. When you're talking to a believer who is fully persuaded who's on the Lord's side, who stands with the written word, who has seen a few things. You aren't going to persuade me any. I'm not pulling out of faith. And that's exactly what people need when they come in. They don't need to see your eyes spin and your head start turning because you're shaken by what the doctor told them. That's whenever they need your, uh-huh, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, you know, here's what, here's what God's word says. Let me tell you what I've seen. You know, let me tell you what happened to a guy in our church. Let me tell you, and you just begin to create that portfolio. If you're interested in helping people through their crisis, no matter what it is, our number one call we get in Tampa isn't for prayer. Ask Pastor Billy, has he seen anybody healed of Lou Gehrig's? Ask Pastor Billy, has he ever seen a mongoloid baby become normal? Has he ever seen somebody completely demon-possessed? Anybody gang-raped that ever fully recovered? I mean, the impossible of the impossible. But th what do these people want to know? I want somebody. I don't want a Bible character. Because I, I believe all the Bible characters. Nobody goes to Starbucks after church to think if whether Bartimaeus was really blind. I don't know if Lazarus was really dead. That's not our problem. The problem is, can that happen to me? And if it happened to me, can I pass that on to her? And somewhere in your thinking, you've got to grow beyond you and realize anything I get can be passed on to anybody that I know. Come on, somebody help me here. You got to do a little bit better than that. Come on, give God a shout.
But you got to learn how to get people and keep them in contact with the Holy Ghost. So I'm in Israel on a tour. You know, we were, I think I was there with Dean and Mary Brown and a couple other people. And we were, and this guy came up to me at the very beginning of the tour. We had three buses. And he came up and he, he had this big pull. You know, I think his name was Barry, if I'm not mistaken. He said, Brother Billy, he said, I just want you to know, I, I came on this tour, but I need a healing. He said, so if you could just pray for me for a healing, he said, I could enjoy this whole tour. Let's just get this thing settled right up at the front. And I was going to pray for him, the Holy Ghost said, I don't want that for him. I want him to hear the Holy Spirit. He's wanting you to hear the Holy Spirit. I don't want him to hear the Holy Spirit. He, I said, what do you want me to do here? He said, tell him that, you'll meet, that I'll meet him somewhere in the tour, and he's supposed to tell you when. So I said, hey, listen, here's what I'm hearing. He said, no, just say a prayer. I'm not supposed to say a prayer. I'm supposed to tell you somewhere in this tour, one of these stops, you're going to hear God say, this is the spot. Whenever you come to that place where you hear this is the spot, you find me, whatever bus I'm on, and we'll have a service right there. He said, oh, gee, I don't. I said, all you got to do is hear God. All you got to do is hear God because you can hear him. If you can close your eyes right now and hear Elvis, you should be able to close your eyes and hear God. <laughs> oh, you didn't like that one, did you? I could tell. <laughs> it's true. How, why can I hear Elvis? Because you spend so much time with him. Or anybody else we could name, but I just chose that as kind of safe. You know. but, so we're going through the tour. We came to the, we, we're at Armageddon. I hadn't seen him the whole tour. We're finally at Armageddon. I had forgot all about him because I gave him that instruction. All of a sudden, I hear people calling through the ranks. Where's Billy Burke? This guy said he's at Armageddon. He's ready to get healed at Armageddon. And I, I went over to the bus. I said, he's there. Man, I'm ready, Brother Burke. Just put those hands on me. I'm ready. This is it. I'm getting healed at Armageddon. I'm getting rid of this pole. I'm going to walk, oh, like I've never walked. I said, did you hear? He said, did I hear? Can you tell that I've heard? I heard it right here, right now. <laughs> Let me borrow those hands right here, right now. <laughs> I put him in touch with him. Not with me. I put him in touch with him. Touched him, he went, the pole went, he got up, man, he was like a bandy rooster. He just, <laughs> and the bottom line was, he didn't even realize it till later, I heard God. I just didn't run to somebody for a healing, I, I heard God. So very important that, that in this hour, with all the conspiratory voices, all the people that are making stuff up and people are buying it left and right, that your God is still saying the same thing. Occupy till I come. Get every area of your life under my occupation. And when the enemy comes to you, there'll be no vacancies in sight. Come on, give God a big shout. Come on. Yeah. Hurry, hurry. Hurry. Any questions? I want to open it up. If you have any questions you'd like to ask us, Shirley, could be. If, I, if you have any, you may not have any. But you have to learn how to unlock people's faith. There's more than this, but I just don't want to go down a long laundry list of this. But your job is to really realize people, most people, you may find that odd person, they have enough faith. Because if you have enough faith to get born again, you have enough faith to get healed. If you have enough faith to speak in tongues, then you have enough faith to get healed. It's just that it's all locked up. We want to get that faith unlocked. And sometimes what unlocks people's faith the most is getting them free from the guilt. They don't think they're good enough. This lady came up on a walker, a breathing oxygen machine, and here's what she said to me. I have emphysema. I've been smoking since I was a little girl, and I got to get healed of this emphysema. And I'll tell you, I'm still smoking. I said, that's not smart. I know, but can you help me? Can God have mercy on me? And I've learned to tread carefully there. You gotta, you gotta discern between you and God. Sometimes you don't have any mercy at all because your daddy raised you. You make a bed, you sleep in that bed. But that's not God. You gotta discern between people around you with regular voices and God. And there she is begging for, for, for healing I could smell the nicotine. She's on an oxygen machine. 
And he said, and, and, and I tell people everywhere that I go, God don't heal you because you're good. He heals you because he's good. And so, so the Holy Ghost just said, put some goodness on it. I said, ma'am, I'm gonna pray you're gonna be completely healed. She said, that's why I come to you. I just love the love you have. I said, well, there's some truth on the way. See, God don't always tell you the truth right away because you can't handle the truth right away. You know, if you're leaning out of a 10-story window and, you, and you're, you know, God don't yell up, where's your smoking in bed? No, God says, jump. He catches you. He takes you. He restores you. He works with you. And about two months later, he says, hey, let's talk about that, that fire. When you're stronger, when you can handle it. You know, you, you got to learn where people are as matter as much as where you are with what you know. How much can they handle? Some people want to pour in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I was in Greenwich, Connecticut, and a friend of mine pastors there, and he said, uh, would you go visit one of our elders? He's dying in the hospital with uh, cancer, and we're really afraid we're going to lose him. He knew you were in town. Would you go visit him? I said, oh, pastor. I said, He's, I, I know you're tired, but would you do it for me? I said, I'll do it for you, which wasn't real nice of me to do that, but I needed my rest for the next three or four nights. So I went down to the hospital. When I got to the hospital room, there was a lot of noise in the room. I could hear, I could hear, and all of a sudden, as closer I got, here's what I heard. In the name of Jesus, I bind that cancer. I bind that spirit. I loosen the devil. I mean, there was, there was like four or five of them. And they surrounded the, I couldn't even see the guy. But I knew he was somewhere in the middle of all that. So I thought, I'm not going in there. I mean, that's, I, that would frighten me. Just. So I waited down the hallway, and I waited till they, they all marched out. And after they all marched out, I went into the room softly. And when I got near his bed, it startled him. Like, he went. I said, calm down. I said, are you okay? He said, oh, who are you? And I said, your pastor sent me down just to talk to you and pray for you. Oh, I can't keep any food down. I can't keep any food down. And the pain. Oh, I got pain. I can't keep the food down. That's all he said. The word cancer was never mentioned. I wasn't going to come out of my lips. I said, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going I'm I'm to pray that your pain goes. I'm going to pray that you hold some food down while I'm here. Here's what he said to me. It was, it was like he came out of a trance. He said, now I can believe for that. <laughs> it had to be broken down to where he was. Most people can't handle being healed of cancer. In a meeting where the anointing and you're moving, yeah, but one-on-one, -on -one, th that word still frightens people. So whether you attack the tree from the roots up or from the bad fruit down, you attack it, you dismantle it. I said, here we go. So I prayed and he said, you know, that pain's leaving. He could believe for pain. I said, well, let's get something in here. What, what, what do you want to eat? I don't, I don't, I can't eat. I said, what do you want to eat? Let's get something, let's get some soft food in you. He swallowed soft food. He said, what you, what's going on? I said, well, it sounds to me like you're getting healed. We're back in the car in. We're not pulling the car in. We're back in it in. But the car is going to get in the garage. Come on, somebody. You've got to shout. Hey! See, the object can't be about you. It's got to be about the person. And too many people are practicing their, to find out their ministry. They care more about their ministry and, and their calling and having a, one more healing on their belt. And they, that's all they care about. They gave, I gave them the verses. I gave them brother so-and-so's dream. I put oil on them. I mean, I rubbed all the whole way down to their big toe. I'll huh? tell you what. And, and then, then you say, well, did they get out of bed? No. Did they get any better? No. Well, maybe they didn't need all of your oil. Maybe they just need you to listen. Care for them. Act empathetically. Maybe they don't have somebody at home that cares for them. Maybe they go home to an empty apartment. Maybe they've never known pure love. They've already known perverted love. 
Maybe. Maybe you're the first chance of somebody really caring for them to get a better quality to not die, to save that last breast, to have that leg from not being cut off. People are facing serious issues. They need some serious believers filled with the love of God. Come on, say Galatians says, faith that worketh by love. Every miracle Jesus did was motivated by love. He really, really cared for you. I spent some time with Oral Roberts before he passed, and I was in his home, and a couple of visits we had with him, and I told him, I said, you know, Dr. Roberts, I said, I've been around a lot of people, but I always sensed when you looked into the camera, I always sensed you cared. My grandmother always sensed that you cared. Big tears rolled down his face. He said, I did my best, but I found out my heart wasn't big enough for all people. Somewhere, Billy, I ran out of room. And don't we all run out of room? Sometimes we care for our four and no more. Or we just care for the white people. Or maybe we just care for the rich people. One guy told me, he said, I love going to New York and witnessing on the streets, but I just can't seem to witness the pretty women. I said, well, I don't know what pretty is to you. He said, well, I'm just, I just can't seem to go near certain women. I said, well, maybe you're having trouble with those women. He said, what kind of trouble would I be having? I said, I don't know. Maybe you don't want to see them saved. Maybe you want to see them another way. Never saw that guy again the rest of my life. (laughs) Caring means it goes back to that Sunday school, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. They're all precious in his sight. Yeah, but what if they're a Democrat? (laughs) Look at the reaction I just caused. Look at that. Yeah, what if they're Democrats? What if? What if they're what if they're a pole dancer? You know, what if there's somebody you never thought you'd ever meet and all of a sudden there they are right in front of you? And they and they're not living anywhere near the way they should be. What what if what if? You've got to be ready for God to place you anywhere at any time. And when they squeeze you, what did, what did David Wilkerson say when Nikki Cruz said, I'm going to cut you into pieces from crossing the switchboard? What did David Wilkerson say? Every piece will say, Jesus loves you. And what did Nikki Cruz say? That melted me. Come on, say, there's nothing like the love of God moving through me. You've got to really, really practice that because we're coming into such racial tension We're coming into people crossing our borders. We're coming into standards of of the transgender that are gonna test the love of God in our churches at maximum effort. Not that we agree with all that they do, but boy, we gotta love beyond what we ever imagined. Come on, somebody give God a big shot. Can you do that? Quickly. Had a guy, had a guy pastor in Toronto. I mean, this just happened not long ago. Because we get there, we get people from Iran, Iraq, rows of people from all over Persia. And this guy came up, he said, uh, I want to have a baby. So I said, well, does your wife want the baby? Isn't that a good question to ask? Does your wife? He said, well, I don't have a wife, but I want to have my own baby. And I thought, I thought, whoa. Well, the cameras are rolling. I thought, where are we going with this? I said, so you want to have your own baby, so that means you're going to meet? I didn't get it. I said, so that means you're going to meet somebody? You feel like God has somebody? No, 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 no. Brother Billy, I tell you, I want God to create the, the organs that I need to have my own baby. I mean, that really knocked me back like one, two, three steps. Because <laughs> I knew the cameras were, now you can always add it, but we try not to do as much of that. And I said, okay, and I bent down like this. So people know know when I bend down, it means I'm needing help. I need a lot of help. (laughs) People say, are you tired, Brother Billy? I'm not tired. I am really reaching for help here. (laughs) So instead of going help, I go help, you know. (laughs) 
And I pulled my hands up, and my announcers and people with me said, we were waiting to see what you said to this guy. I said, you know what, sir? I'm going to put a prayer on you that you're never going to forget. I'm going to pray that God blesses you and blesses your body and blesses you to just do the works of I just stayed completely away from his request. I wasn't going to rubber stamp that. But I was going to just put a request, keep this man healthy, keep his internal organs all singing the song of God, you know, and... And he's over here, he don't know what's going on. Amen, 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 amen. <laughs> I'm thinking God has you blindfolded and you don't even know it. <laughs> he got slain and I got out of there. Come on, can you say amen? <laughs> Come on, give him a shout. <laughs> Question. Go ahead, sir. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I'm new in this church, maybe a couple of months. And my pastor prayed, um, called me, gave me a word of wisdom. I think that's what it's called, about my pain, the pain on my back. But then I, it happened again that I am still feel the pain. And I'm from a family where they do witchcraft, they worship idols. So. Okay. The last time I fasted three days, I saw one lady. She told me, we're going to get you down. I saw a dream where they told me to join the witchcraft. I said, no. I had three accidents in one year, and that's the last one that hurt my back. Mm -hmm. I can't walk. So, and I sometimes in dream I see them chasing me with gun and knife and stuff like that all the time. It's been happening my whole life. Help me interpret that, Mister. You got the microphone. Tell me what he's saying. I it's didn't a witchcraft catch all of it. in my family. I'm talking. He, he has. He has. Um. Uh, he's dealing with witchcraft in his family. Okay. And he's having dreams about it. Okay. And he's. Uh, and he's from an accident. And he has a hurt back still. He, from, pain, he had a car accident? Pain, uh, pain all the time, yes, car accident. So what's his question? So when you, call out, when you call out for a healing and he goes up, you pray for him, he goes home and he still has that pain, does that mean that the healing wasn't for him at that time or what does that mean? It means maybe we didn't hit the root. You know, you don't heal the demon. You can't cast out the flesh and you can't heal the demon. Say that with me. You can't heal the demon. Can't cast out the flesh. So again, sometimes in a meeting, diagnosis is difficult because the, the meeting moves quickly. So you don't always get the right diagnosis. You miss it. Or you may see something you don't want to create distraction for the rest of the meeting. Or maybe the pastor's uncomfortable with what's going on. My job is to come under the authority of whatever. Now, if I'm in my own meeting, it's a little different. If I'm under a church like this, my job is to come underneath the authority. Respect the authority, keep the peace, do the best that I can, you know, to come across that line. And there's ways you can deal with that. But from what you're saying, and that is the root, there's a root there from what you just told me that needs to be dealt with. It's probably more deliverance than it is healing. And that's got to, you can't heal that. So that's why you went home. That's why it was still there. And that's why it hates what you're saying right now because you were uncovering what is it you really need. Come on, give God a shout. But just because somebody tells you you need delivered, that's not the end of it all. There's a lot of stuff that brings people pleasure. And when it comes right down to it, they, they want to get delivered, but they don't want to lose the pleasure that it brings them. They don't want to lose the power that it brings them. I saw Catherine Kuhlman pray for a guy. He got out of the wheelchair. He hadn't been able to walk in 10 or 15 years. I was sitting right, right next there. And she, he got out. And Miss Kuhlman said, I'll tell you something today, sir. You'll be back in this chair within a week. And he said, but why? She said, you delight in your sin. You like your sin too much. So even though she was used to, to bring it, he was saying, if you don't change, if you don't walk away from this, this is not a rubber stamp that everything you're... Healing somebody doesn't mean God's happy with your life. He's trying to create motivation in you to live right. He's trying to create motivation. I, I got to get... There's more for what came from Father's house. But too many people use a healing. God must be happy with me. No, no. You don't pray. You don't give. You never read your Bible. And you hardly forgive anybody. Why would he be happy with that? Okay, I'm going over on this side over here. 
Come on, say amen. amen. Obedience is what makes God happy, or at least trying to be. God, help me love my children. Help me love my ex-wife and treat her right. You know, God hates divorce, but he hates cruelty. Don't be treacherous. The word treacherous means don't be cruel. Even though you have a divorce, don't be cruel about it. He don't like either one, but he don't like when you're cruel with people, talking about them. I would never talk about a political opponent's health. I would never talk about somebody that can't remember. I'm not, you know, I'm not voting liberal. I love babies. We should see life. But I'm not going to talk about somebody's loss of memory. They can't walk. They can't hear right. They stumble and they fall. Fight fair. Fight fair. Fight the policies. Stay away from saying about people's health and their weight and the way they look. There's a lot of people that can't help the way they are. They got there the same way a lot of us get there, by shock value. By the time they learned it was not the right way, they ended up there. Come on, say, mercy comes to all of our house. Come on. Give God a big shot for what I just said. Come on. Yeah. Right here. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for last night, by the way, and thank you, Jesus. But my question is, I have like a special needs kid, and I'm around a lot of special needs, non-verbal kids, non-communication. Yeah. What's the best way to identify and unlock their faith without that type of communication? Love them. Amen. Love them. Amen. But, but, but you can always bypass the natural person. When you speak faith, just speak into their ear. Hey, hey I want to tell you about you. Miracles are coming your way. God's about to restore everything in your life. The word of God does not return. Come on, people. Come on. Now, wait a minute. Hey, 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 hey. Hold on. Hold on there, partner. Hold on there. That may mean he may have to leave the scene a lot of times without manifestation. So when you leave the scene without manifestation, listen to me. Guard your mouth. And who you talk to. And if somebody comes and says, yeah, i seen you praying for Alice. I mean, she goes up for every evangelist. She goes up for every preacher. And that's your job is to say, all I know is I'm, I'm with her in faith. I am not breaking my covenant. I told her she'll be hearing and seeing. I'm going to stick by that. Yeah, but you don't understand. Listen, get out of my way. I'm standing with that girl. You weren't up there. She was. You seem to be pretty healthy. She's not. I'm standing with her. Come on, give God a big shout. Come on. For all the people that have questions are in the last row. Did you notice that? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, this question is, um, me and my wife do deliverance, and God uses, that, uses us in that way. But there's times where the Holy Spirit would just stop us, and so the healing comes first. Yeah. And, like, I kind of obey him, so I, like, I, I kind of stop, so. Inner healing, usually, that? that's, that usually that's an inner healing that comes first. Inner healing will, will springboard a lot of deliverance. Inner, he, mostly inner healing, but that, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, that's uh, true. That was my question. So. That was what? That was, that was his question. You answered it. Yeah. When you take away demon food, demon food is pain. Come on, say, demon food is pain. They feed on pain. So sharks feed on a dead whale. You remove the dead whale and the sharks leave. So when you, when, that's why inner healing is the biggest need in the church. So never underestimate. In physical healing, we get all excited because we can see it. But understand something. People are broken today on the inside. You know, and so getting healed on the inside, once you begin to get healed on the inside, and a lot of times with inner healing, there are screams. They don't have to be devils. Pain has a noise. Don't assume because somebody screamed, boy, they all came out. She had a lot of pain. Maybe she had a lot of pain. Maybe she had a lot of pain that you don't know about. Most people, we don't know, we don't know that much about anybody. We don't. We think we do, but we don't. Now, just give people the space to be whole. Give people space. Pull back your judgment. Pull back your shock and awe. And just think of what all you're hiding here this morning. 
that you wouldn't want anybody to know. Give people that same liberty. But when you're ministering inner healing and people are being strong enough to hear that, you know, that they were raped or they were molested or that they were closet, whatever, whatever, then, you, you know, you're going you're gonna to get all kind of reaction. But then once that inner healing happens, man, deliverance can just take place. It can be passengers leaving them or pain leaving them. That inner healing, the key to inner healing is forgiveness. That's the key that unlocks everything in you to inner healing is forgiving somebody, forgiving yourself, forgiving, you know, a pastor, a priest, forgiving, you know, it's just amazing. So when you see some of these people on the news, you know, that like this Long Island where all these people were buried, or I mean, think about the pain of these missing children that don't come home. Think about the pain that these mothers have to live every day. When Natalie Holloway was taken and Beth Holloway, they spent millions of dollars trying to find that. They had the money to spend. They loved their daughter. But every night, they got to go to bed not knowing where their daughter is. Is she alive or not alive? There's people all over the world like this. That's why the Bible says the whole earth is groaning. For what? The coming of the Lord. Trees, the rocks, the soil, the animals, they're all groaning for this great day, this great catching away. The elders, the, the martyrs underneath the throne in Revelation 4, they cry and saying, how long do we have to wait? How much longer, Lamb of God, do we have to wait? Come on, wrap this thing up. Come on, somebody put your hands up. Come on, say, we got to wrap this up. <laughs> one more question. Go ahead, one more question. Go ahead. Um, my... My mom has dementia. My brother had a stroke. My son, who had a transplant, is now having complications. Has what, I, your son? A transplant, a kidney transplant. Okay, is now wow. having complications. Wow. He's seven years old. Wow. Um, with my mom, like her level of understanding, we pray for her. There's scriptures over the house. We have her repeat. I take care of her, so, you know, we have the contact. My brother, I don't have no contact with them, but, you know, he sent his word, healed his disease. I pray what I think I know how mm. for my brother who I don't have any contact with. For my son, I pray how I, how do you stand in the gap? That's my question. And is it? You're doing you, it. You're doing it. You are doing it. You care. You care. You just told me about three different people that you're carrying them. You're carrying these people down on the roof and down through the roof, and you're doing all that you can. You were showing Jesus how much you love these family members. It's on you. It's in you. It, I can hear it when you talk. It's, you're doing it. Continue. I mean, continue to do whatever he tells you. Take communion for somebody else. Next time you have communion in church, don't take it for you. Take it for somebody else. Fast, fast, do fasting. Do, you know, do whatever. Just do everything you know how to do. But you're doing it, girl. You're doing it. Just continue to trust well, that. Well, yeah, when they don't manifest, that don't mean they're not going to. Okay. I'll close with this thought. And here's a thought that really came to me, and I live by this thought because I do walk by faith. But I don't faith it to faith it. Get off that merry-go-round. I faith it to see it. I faith it to feel it. I don't feel it to faith it. I don't go by feeling. But my whole object in doing what I do is to see. I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want to hold it. Because if you don't get into being manifest-minded, all you'll do all your life is pray for people and thinking you're doing all that you can do. Praying for people is more than maybe what you're doing. But to take it even a step further, come on, say, I want to see it. I want to see her walk. I want to see her without the glasses. I want to see her head wound healed. That should be your ultimate goal besides walking with the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. But today, everybody's, the way they get out of everything is not by, I'm faith in it, I'm faith in it. Well, faith it, but faith it to what? Don't faith it just to keep faithing it. Have a desired goal. What's the big picture? It's good to have a desire to go. I want to see them whole. Someone says, yeah, but they, how, how is that, how's that going to happen? 
I believe in a God that can do everything. I believe in Mark 10, 27. With God, all, come on, somebody, with God, all things. See, everybody has to have that signature verse that you live by. Mine is not by his stripes. I mean, I live with that, not by that. I live by Mark 10, 27. Come on, say, with God. With God. In all things. All things. That means you, your house, your car, your money. I mean, I'm not gonna be in standing in front of me thinking that anything's impossible. I've seen too much. I'm, I'm fully persuaded. I've been, uh, you got the wrong person. But you're crazy. I probably am part-time. Come on, somebody help me here. <laughs> Come on. Let's put our hands up. I'm gonna hand it over to the pastor here for just a second, but... I wanna pray for you this morning. It's been a great morning session. Have you learned anything today? Okay. Put your hands up and say, I, I have, the ability, have the ability by the grace of God, grace of God to, unlock to unlock people's faith. I don't have to leave them, have to leave them. Without, hope, without hope, without a prayer, without, a prayer. without any sense of breakthrough. Sense of breakthrough. By my excitement, my testimony, my testimony, a word from the Lord, word from the Lord. A, personal a personal example, by the gifts of the Spirit, the of the Spirit. somehow, some way, somehow there's some way, there's a way into everybody's heart. Into everybody's if, I really care, if I really care, I will take the time, take the time to, listen to listen and hear their heart and, hear their heart and, maybe, find and maybe find the clue that will unlock their door. Unlock I'm on a new mission. Everybody that stands in front of me, at a restaurant, at a store, down here by the church, on vacation, at a flea market, all of my Facebook friends, everybody that I tap into, beware, I carry a shadow, I got rivers, I have a fire, I'm on a mission. Signs and wonders and miracles too. Come on, somebody give God a shout. Come on, stand to your feet. How many would say you got something out of today? Eyes of revelation, understanding, unlocked and open. How many would say by the end of this week, you're gonna be used to listen to one person? Become passionate about the things of God for someone, to unlock someone's faith. I see miracles here today. Don't forget tonight, 7 p.m., Apostle John Eckhart would be with us. Doors open, 6 p.m. It's gonna be amazing, an amazing time in God's presence. I'm gonna ask you as we dismiss today, take your belongings, take your things. We need to turn over the sanctuary, no saving seats, so you can come back at 6 p.m. when those doors open. Such a blessing to see you today. Man, today was so good. Let me bless you. Father, thank you for your children. Thank you for your word. I ask that you would use us to unlock the faith of others. Let us be used in new levels. Let us see new things. Let us see what you've called us to be. I ask that you open doors for people here today. May we carry a new level of expectancy and faith in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. We'll see you tonight. It's gonna be a great time. God bless you.